At this point, I would like to invite to the stage the person who, while serving as a Minister of Finance during the years 2003-2005, led enormous efforts which have been proven fruitful in promoting Israel's economy and have been highly instrumental to Israel's accession to the OECD. Dear guests, I would like to welcome the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, please rise. Thank you. I'm very pleased to uh, see you all in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Richard Boucher, uh, OECD Secretary General Deputy, and an old friend, and Cameron Kerry, and Lauren Strickling, and Dr. Ro Guy Rotkoff, and Yoram Cohen, and everybody else uh, who is here. Uh, OEC delegates, uh, representatives of uh, the various companies and countries that are dealing with this issue, I'm going to surprise you. Um, I am going to talk about the issue of this conference uh, <laughs> later on. But uh, first I have to say that it's a pleasure to receive all of you in the context of the first OECD meeting held in Israel. Uh, as the famous line goes, uh, we think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Uh, Israel is looking forward to being a full partner with other OECD countries and with the organization itself in addressing the global economic challenges that face each one of our countries. Now, for Israel, joining the OECD was important for two reasons. First, it reminds us how far we've come. And second, it, it points to where we have to go from here. So first on how far we've come. Israel has enacted a series of uh, economic reforms over the last 20 years that have uh, fundamentally transformed our economy. I had the opportunity to help lead some of these reforms. First as a Prime Minister in the 1990s and then as Finance Minister uh, from 2003 to 2005 and again as Prime Minister today. We liberalized Israel's currency until um, 12 years ago. Israel was um, a fourth world country. You couldn't take more than a was I'll use uh, Clint Eastwood's uh, uh, statement, you couldn't take more than a fistful of dollars out of the country. And uh, if you came back and you had a fistful of dollars, you had to register it with the central bank. Uh, and you can imagine this was happening when Israel was producing the technology for transferring funds around the world, billions and billions of dollars at the flick of a, of a computer. And at the same time, we were basically a, a, a very tight, tightly controlled economy. So the first reform, and I don't mention it lightly, was freeing up our currency. Uh, we adopted a new fiscal policy that strictly controlled spending and dramatically cut taxes. We actually had a law that was in place as long as I was finance minister that actually reduce the government spending per capita for three years. Try that. That is not politically a very happy place to be. But we did this, including the overhauling of our welfare system. We privatized government monopolies. We reformed our capital markets and our pension system. I know that's a hot topic in some uh, company, countries right now. But we raised our retirement age for men from 65 to 67 and for women from 60 to 64. 
I have not yet found a single voter who voted for me for enacting that reform. And now we're in the midst of a, of a major land and building reform. The 5% growth that we had here in, since 2004, with the exception of the one-year dip, was achieved without real estate and construction because it's virtually impossible to build anything in this country. So that we see as a great opportunity. What other people see as a problem, we see as an opportunity if we remove the steel boot of regulation from a coil spring, we can create growth that in many ways is internally generated and is not dependent, that component of growth, on the world markets. We're in the midst of uh, connecting our country in um, a network of roads, fast rail, and fast internet. These are all uh, fairly mundane, but they could have, will have, uh, a tremendous effect, impact on our economy. Now, all of these reforms were and are directed to one goal, to make Israel's economy freer, more competitive, so that we can unleash the enormous, enormous potential that is uh, in our people. Uh, Israel has what the economists like to call human capital. In per capita terms, we lead the world in the number of scientists, engineers, and high-tech startups. Uh, our per capita uh, spending on R&D is the highest in the world as well. Now, such an entrepreneurial and dynamic workforce, I believe, will be decisive in the 21st century because I think that the developed nations that will excel in the 21st century, once they pass the initial stage of development, are those that will produce the greatest concentration of conceptual products. And a country's ability to harness the brain power of its people will be the most important driver of prosperity in the, our, in the coming decades and in this century. I think Israel is well poised to compete in the global market because we put a premium on brain power. Uh, I think that a market with a free flow of information and ideas where companies and individuals need to know how to adapt quickly to a rapidly changing world is a challenge that we can meet. Uh, I think that the advantages that we have in the information age uh, is, to also, is also accompanied by a challenge to ensure an environment where information is protected, and this is something of importance to us, and it's something that is important to every free country in the world, because we pride ourselves, as do other free societies, on having free information. But this freedom comes also with uh, great threats to our privacy and to our security. We have many Israeli companies that are addressing these uh, twin challenges. They've excelled in developing software that protects information. But as the challenge of protecting information in a cyberspace become more and more complex, uh, I know that Israeli companies will continue to develop cutting-end technologies. This is not uh, just the problem of individuals. It is first the problem of an individual. If somebody penetrates into uh, your space in a social network, and I think there's some represented here. Uh, is Facebook here? Google? Uh, all of them. This is not just a problem for the individuals as customers or as citizens. It's a problem for the country. And it's a problem also on the international level. If somebody breaks into your bank account, it's your problem. But it's also the national economy's problem. And it's also the international banking system's problem and the international problem, the international community's problem in general. Now we'll have to adopt measures to protect our societies, 
to protect our individuals, but also to protect our societies. Protecting the individual is part of that national and international uh, guarding of freedom. But countries will also have to take special efforts to protect key industries, for example, banking, power, utilities, the capacity to threaten individual security and privacy also threatens national, vital national and international interests. And I believe that uh, in the 21st century, cyberspace security is an absolutely critical component of the security of free societies. So this is a huge challenge. And it's one that I know you're addressing in one of its most important dimensions, maybe in its most fundamental building block. But this will occupy us more and more as technology moves forward and as the challenges mount and multiply. The challenge uh, that we face is not merely technological, not in this country and not around the world. We have to adopt new standards and new regulations, and I'm sure we're up to it. There will be a period of dislocation. This always happens with the uh, entry of new technologies into our world. But on the whole, we're moving to a better future. This future will require better education, I think a, a more uh, woven uh, populace that has the ability to give each child, uh, each citizen, the ability to be part of it and not to be left on the sidelines. And I have no doubt that in these vital areas, many others, we have a lot to learn from each other. And that is why I believe that the OECD efforts to address this issue and the many other issues that we're discussing together will help create an environment that is critical to our common prosperity, but also to our common security. This is, uh, this is something that may not be fully obvious today, but the ability to give individuals the right to pursue their own thoughts, to record their dreams, to communicate with one another without the feeling that they're being encroached on, that somebody is prying into their private lives, I think is one of the uh, great challenges of the 21st century, and it's something that will guarantee the 22nd as well. Thank you for uh, coming to Israel. I hope to see you in the next OECD conference here and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Welcome to Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand until the Prime Minister leaves. Thank you. We will wait another two minutes and then I want to thank the Prime Minister of Israel for, for his very, I would say, pro-privacy and pro-security speech. Um, and uh, in a few minutes, I would uh, like you to have you all come and to, to, into the foyer and to have uh, our, uh, the closing event of this uh, opening session uh, with music and food. Okay. You are invited out. <laughs>